The Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The title of this morning's message is Strength Through Submission. I'll say that again. It is Strength Through Submission. Here we have the Lord calling Simon Peter off that he might give him a word, truly a word from God. Simon Peter has walked with the Lord Jesus Christ now for some three and a half years. And he calls to his attention that Satan has asked for him that he may sift him as sweet. To truly appreciate this, we have to take a good look at the person of Simon Peter. And to get a running start, if you will, because the spotlight will primarily be upon Simon Peter and the Lord Jesus Christ. Also allow me then to go to the Gospel of John. And we're going to come back to this some point later. But the Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 35. John, chapter 1, verse 35. And it reads, Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned, and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, when translated, teacher, where are you staying? But he said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is Chaldean Aramaic for the stone, a piece of the stone. We know it in the Greek as Peter, which is translated a stone. We see here a declaration, a prophetic utterance spoken over Simon Peter. For when his brother brought him to Jesus, saying, we have found the Messiah, Jesus looking upon Simon Peter and declared unto him, you shall be called Cephas, or you shall be called Peter. Please make note of that. God looked at Simon and looked in his face and said, you shall be Cephas, so you shall be Peter. Henceforth, I refer to him as Peter. This is critical because the thing that you must recognize is that God will choose you and receive you as you are. That's good news. For when he found me, I was in sin. I didn't know enough to do enough right because I was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. There wasn't enough do good in me to do good. But one day, God called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. And he did not reject me, but he received me unto himself. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And then sometime, you know, after walking with Jesus for the first two weeks or the f first four months, there was joy unspeakable. It seemed like everybody wanted to bless me. And I was like, oh, God, you just give me all kind of favor. And he was. And that's because he held me close because I was just an infant in his arms. My earthly age mattered not. All I knew was this new thing called being a Christian. Though I was raised in the church, the church was not in me. I don't know how many of you had that experience. You know, you might have had your name on the church roll, but you didn't even know the pastor's name. 
Oh, yeah, come on, that's okay. You know, uh, you were on hold. Some of you were maybe like me, a member of that boy, but all you knew about was God the Father and God the Son, but you had no knowledge of the Holy Spirit. Some of you might have been like me. But I thank God that he had an appointment for me. At the epical time, he was going to say, Marvin, come out of darkness into the marvelous light. You shall be. Now, I didn't realize what my shall be was. I was just glad to be a part of the body. I was just glad to really just to be saved. You know, because you know that in, within you, when there is a God conscious or a God calling, when you're sinned, there is a troubling in your spirit. You know right from wrong. But there was no Holy Spirit in me. There was just a knowledge I knew that God was real and Jesus was real. But I was insufficient to be anything other than what I was. Such is Simon Peter, a fisherman that was walking with John the Baptist, being told that the greater one is coming. And when Jesus came on the scene and John baptized him, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And John transferred them from his tutelage unto the safekeeping of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? God has a plan for you. He has a plan for me. We are not always completely aware of that plan. As a matter of fact, we rarely understand the plan when we first come to the Lord. You might have been like me, just joyful to really have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But the Lord tells Simon Peter, you shall be Peter. And so he left his nest. Peter, James, and John, the sons of Zebedee, left the fishing business, and they followed Jesus. And so began the transformation process of leaving the old man and coming into the new. When we learn how to walk with Jesus, sometimes our walk is a little wobbly. Ah, well, it's just like a toddler. You know, once, you know, you, you say, I think I got this. I, I think I got this. And you wobble a little bit, but you're still trying to balance yourself. And that's what Peter was doing, but he didn't realize that he was walking a little wobbly. But you fully appreciate Peter. We can just look at the many things that Peter did. Peter was outspoken. Peter was a little impetuous. Peter, you know, he didn't always think before he spoke. Such were some of us. We just, brrr, oop, did I say that? <laughs> My bad. <laughs> you know, but Peter was still part of the inner circle. Let me remind you, remember, Peter walked on water. Like the other 11 stayed in the boat. This is in Matthew 14 where the Lord Jesus Christ sent them to the other side. He said, go to the other side. I'm going to uh, uh, send the people away and go on the mountaintop to pray. Matthew 14, verse 28. And round about the third watch, between 3 and 6 a.m., the disciples were struggling against the tempestuous wind, and Jesus came walking on the water. And when they looked, and behold, they figured it was a ghost and just let out, ah, it's a ghost. And Jesus said, oh, peace, it is I. And Simon Peter said, Lord, if it be you, bid me come down out of the boat onto the water and walk unto you. And he says, come on down, Peter. Now, Peter climbed off the boat. The other 11 would probably say, man, Peter, I did it again. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, Peter, Peter, Peter's special, man. They'd be like, yeah, I know. James and John knew him well. I know Peter's special, man, but just love on him, love on him. But Peter climbed out the boat, y'all. And he walked on water with Jesus. So I'm going to give Peter his props. And as long as he walked and kept his eyes on Jesus, he walked on every situation that was coming against him. This water could be a metaphor for the world coming against you. And all hell is busted loose. The winds and the forces of the world is coming against you. But and you're walking on your situation. You're walking on your problem. You're walking on the turbulence in your life. Peter did it. It's in the book. Yes, it's a serious miracle. I don't know about you, but I can't even swim, let alone walk on water. <laughs> so I'm going to give Peter his props. He walked on water. He walked on the bills coming due. He walked on the, on the healing that was needed. He walked on the boss that was a problem. He walked on that situation. You've got to see what Jesus is showing him. And as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus... He walked on that problem. I'm trying to talk to somebody this morning. But the scripture says when he, because when he saw the wind, you check the scripture, that's what it says. He began to sink. 
and he cried out. He did not say, Lord, I magnify your name. I praise you. He said, Jesus, save me. That's a quick and effective prayer. When you find yourself in a sinking situation, you ain't got time for, oh, I know you're the great I am. I know you the Lord, Jesus, save me. For the word of God says, who shall I call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You ain't got to go to seminary. You ain't, got, you ain't even got to go to rock school. Maybe you should, but you ain't got to. But you better call on Jesus. When your life is sinking and you've called your mama, you've called your dad, you've called your brother, you've called your cousin, but you haven't called on Jesus, man, you better let the first and the last name you call on be Jesus. He's a very present help in time of trouble. I don't know if I'm talking to anybody. I thought I was talking to some worshipers. Maybe y'all ain't had no troubles yet. I recently turned 65 and I had some troubles. Life got turbulent for me. Got hospitalized over a bad procedure and was weak. But God, that's all I got to say. Here I stand. A drunk nearly, a drunk hit my car while I was putting stuff in the back seat. And I'm like, seeing the car rock. And I'm like, what the heck going on? I back out and see the car hit and the drunk going down the road. I'm like, oh, God. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, I magnify your name to you. Thank you. Oh, yes. He kept his eye on me. And not a hair on his gray head was touched. I just didn't know what was happening seeing the car rock the way it did. And when I saw the drunk going on down the road, I go, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yes, I did. That's my wife. I spoke in tongues for about 13 minutes. <laughs> Might have been 14. Uh, the Oakland police lady asked me what happened. <laughs> she said, uh, 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 I'm going to give you the report in a minute. I got to thank God for right now. So God can keep you. Oh, that's a true story. You can ask my wife. Amen. He said, touch not my anointed. Do my prophets no harm. Back to Peter. Peter walked on water until he took his eyes off Jesus. And he began to sing. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and saved Peter. And then the two of them. <laughs> continued to walk on water <laughs> to the boat. When they climbed into the boat, the scripture says here and only here in Matthew that then the disciples worshiped Jesus. Search it, put me to the test. One of the problems that sometimes we have is that we treat Jesus as though he's just the man upstairs. And we treat God the Father as the big guy. It's called being common. Uh, in the Latin, it's called vulgar. That's where we get to uh, the term vulgar language. It's common. It's not befitting one of the king's kids. That's a legitimation for you. <laughs> but the problem is, when you're walking with Jesus, and Jesus had given the disciples authority over unclean spirits, and authority to heal the sick, and authority to cleanse lepers, and authority in his name to do miraculous works. They've got to thinking, well, look what I'm doing. <laughs> I've arrived. I'm casting out devils. Yeah, yeah, I'm laying hands on the sick. Uh-huh, and I'm cleansing lepers. Look at me now. For when the disciples came back, when the 70 came back, oh, they were so overjoyed. And they came to Jesus to give their report. They said, even spirits are subject to us. And Jesus said, ah, oh, don't let, don't, don't be caught up with that. Oh, that's no big deal. I saw Satan fall from heaven like a boat of lightning. That's no big deal. Oh, but you want to rejoice? Rejoice because your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You want to have your hallelujah moment? Right, get busy dancing because your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. Glory. Not because demons are subject to you. I suspect. Now, I don't have a scripture that directly back me up. But I suspect that even Judas Iscariot might have cast out a demon. I suspect that Judas Iscariot might have laid his hands on the sick and he might have recovered. I suspect Judas might have even done such deeds. But his name was not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Let me give it on this story of Peter. 
Go with me to Matthew 16. Peter walked on water. The disciples worshipped him. And they bowed down. They no longer had the same revelation that what manner of man is this. For when Jesus told the disciples, let us go over to the other side, and he was in the boat, and a great storm arose, and Jesus was in the back of the boat asleep. The disciples, again, were fearful and overtaken with fear. And they came to Jesus, woke him up, said, Master, care thou not that we perish? They awakened, and Jesus spoke to the wind. He said, Peace be still, and the winds and the seas obeyed him. And they said, What manner of man is this? Oh, but this time they caught the revelation, <laughs> and they worshiped him. And they realized, this is not some man. This is God incarnate. And our desire, my desire, this ministry's desire, is that you will not see Jesus as some man. That you will see him as your redeemer, deliverer. That you'll see him as your Lord and your Savior. You'll see him as your life and your love. You'll see him as your everything. For it's in him that we live, move, and have our very being. We can do nothing without him. Prior to Jesus, I was a dead man walking. Prior to Jesus, you were a dead man, dead woman walking. We owe our life to the Father and the Son. Hallelujah. We owe it all to Jesus. Amen? But Peter was special. The Lord Jesus Christ had declared that thou shalt be Peter. And we see here in Matthew chapter 16, where in verse 17, well, let me back up to verse 13. Matthew chapter 16, beginning at verse 13. It says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? I have a question for you. Who do you say Jesus is? You don't have to answer. Hopefully you'll say, he's my Lord and my Savior, my Redeemer and my Deliverer. He's my life and my love. He's my all in all. I'm nothing without him. Amen? Amen. Just, you know, that may be, and you're free to say even more than that. Verse 15, he says, he says unto them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Verse 18. And I say, and I also say to you that you are Peter. Transformation has taken place. He's been walking with Jesus, and Jesus has declared that which he prophesied has now come to pass. You are Peter. Yes, I put you to the test a couple of times, and I have not rejected you. I'm now letting you know that you are Peter. Because the Father has given you a revelation confirming the question that only God the Father can reveal. Your epic moment has come, Peter. You are Peter. And on this rock, Jesus is talking about himself now, I will build my church, and the gates of hell or Hades, shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. It must come by revelation. But notice here, now Jesus has promoted Peter. He has declared him, you are Peter. And he's given him greater authority, which is to come. He says, whatsoever things you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Whatsoever things you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What this means is that I'm giving you authority because what you get will be straight from the throne room. And so whatever you declare, I've already spoken it to you. Just as the father tells the son what to say and the son says it. Now Peter has been elevated to that position because Jesus is about to leave this world. And he has already promised and declared to Peter that thou shalt be. And so he pronounced and declares unto Peter, the things that you declare on earth has already been declared in heaven. Because I have already established you and declared that you're going to be the one what you hear from on high, you can declare openly. Amen? Amen? And so now one can see where maybe Peter might be, maybe, just maybe,
maybe he might be getting a little bit full of himself. Well, after all, he was just a fisherman, an uneducated fisherman. He smelled like fish daily. Come on. You're like, man, what was that, trout? You know, don't matter. He smelled, he was fishy, okay? You know, I've got to bring the elements into this because if you're a fisherman, you're going to smell like fish. If you're a shepherd, you're going to smell like sheep. Okay? And so here he's been elevated from a fisherman to the inner circle of the God of all creation. Him, James, and John were those who Jesus brought with him when he cast out demons, who he brought into the house when he raised the dead. They were special to Jesus. And Simon Peter, I think I mentioned, that he walked on water. And Jesus did declare that you're going to be Cephas. And so he might have started to feel, <laughs> yeah. And later on in his walk, we start to see it. Here, let's stay with me in Matthew's gospel. Let's jump to verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Yeah, uh, yeah, like, what, 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 excuse me? Verse 23, but he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Now, you have to look through Peter's eyes. Like, you know, if you're familiar with the gospel, you know that Peter, James, and John, they were, you know, secretly like, I want to sit on the right hand. I want to sit on the left hand when you come into your kingdom. I, I want some authority. I want to be a shot caller. I want to be a baller, a shot caller. I want to be a big shot too. And, and Jesus knew his disciples were murmuring in the background. No, man, I'm going to be the greatest man because I got call second man. No, you're going to be, no, uh, uh. He, but he called me. He said, I'm going to be Cephas. And, and, and so Jesus had to address that. He had to address that. Because, you see, Peter was starting to show some elements that were very carnal, some elements that were quite proudful, some elements that were of this world. Sometimes, even though with our sanctified selves, if we're not mindful, we will let Satan use us to say something that we regret a moment later. It's so essential to be mindful. It's so essential to be watchful and prayerful. Because the thing is, if we're not watchful and prayerful, we could be a stumbling block to someone. Sad to say, there's been times when I look back, I realize when I played a video of my walk, I said, ooh, thank you, Lord, for the grace. For that which I said or that which I did was, was, not a potential, but was a stumbling block. And when you come into that light of understanding of how God was gracious to you and how when you played what you said or when you played a video and you go, ooh, man. Man, you start walking with greater reference. You start walking with greater purpose and greater intention because you know your words and your thoughts count and they matter. For the devil is an opportunist. How many, how many of y'all have ever been sucker punched by the devil? You ain't got to raise your hand. Don't do it. Don't raise your hand. Don't raise. But you know that from time to time when you weren't watchful, weren't prayerful, you oh, man, oh, sucker punch. Okay, devil. <laughs> okay. And, and you try to rebuke God. When God is doing something in your life, you come over and say, man, pray for me. Such and such is going on. And when the Spirit is like, mm, no, that ain't the devil. That's God chasing you, man. <laughs> Listen, why don't I just pray that you will get an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying, that you will surrender to the will of God. And then you won't be in that pressure situation anymore. Uh, I'm sorry. Hold, hold. And so, let me pray with you so that you won't be trying to rebuke the hand of God when he's chasing his child. I'm just saying, don't be trying to rebuke Jesus when he brings you a word. Oh. Let me move on back. Let's go back. So now we got to build on, you know, this is one of those things where like we see a movie and you see the last scene and the time bomb is ticking. You only got five seconds and tick, tick, tick. And then it flashes back to three and a half years ago. <laughs> and so we flash back to three and a half years ago when Peter was first told, you sell be Cephas. And you walked on water and you lay hands on sick folk and you cast out demons. And now Jesus said, you have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And then you, what? 
in your carnal thinking. Begin to rebuke the King of kings and the Lord of lords. What's wrong with you? Uh, we're going to see. Let's go back to Luke 22. Then we're going to do the last and second half of this thing. I'm almost finished. You know when a preacher says that, that's about another 30 minutes, right? <laughs> in case you didn't know that, that means about another 30 minutes. But, you know, if y'all good, I'll make it 25. Amen. And you can see, this message is strength through submission. And we just want to get a snapshot of Peter's mindset, which brings us to this point. Back to Luke 22, verse 31. And the Lord says, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I pray for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, Strengthen your brethren. One of the things that I've come to have more awareness of since my walk with the Lord began is that spiritual activity is taking place around me at all times. Spiritual activity has been taking place before the foundation of the world. The devil and the angels of God have been there before the earth was formed. The rebellion took place before I was. God threw Satan out. Long before I got here. So spiritual activity is a fact of this universe, not just the fact of life on earth. For the devil is the prince and power of the air. And we know if you've ever read the book of Job, that Job was someone that God bragged on. And when Satan came before the presence of God, for he walks to and fro, the Lord asked him, where have you come from, Satan? He said, going to and fro in the earth. And God says, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan says, yeah, I've considered him, but you got a hedge around him. you got a fist too high, I can't climb over. you got a wall too thick, I can't burrow through it. Yeah, I would love to get it out of Marvel. Yeah, I would love to get it past the company. Yeah, I would love to get it, Sister Maria. But you got a hedge around her. Yes, I'd love to get at him. And God knows me better than I know myself. He knows you. Better than you know yourself. He knows your ups and downs, your going out and your coming in. He knows where you're strong. He knows where you're weak. And here we see where the devil, just as he was going into the presence of God concerning Job, he has been badgering Jesus, if I may amplify the scripture. When he says here that he's asked for you, let me assure you, it was not just one single asking. Because the devil, he saw something in Peter when Peter rebuked the Lord Jesus Christ. He saw carnality. He saw authority. He saw a desire. He said, ooh, I, need, I get to exploit that. Look, but Jesus, the great intercessor, was interested. Nope, devil. Nope, nope, nope. Don't touch my anointed. Nope, you can't do a thing to him. Until this epic time where he says, okay, I'm about to leave here. And I need Peter to be refined. I need Peter to come into a greater understanding of who he is and who I am. Just as with you and me. He will allow the devil to cause us to cry out and de to become more dependent upon him. The thing that Peter had was too much self-confidence. And what God will require of all of his elect is to be dependent on Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let me say it again. What God will have all of us to do is to become dependent upon the Lord Jesus. And so, he says, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as sweet. This passage of Scripture means to agitate you, to stir you up on the inside, to trouble that which you have come to rely upon, your self-confidence. And so, if any of you have ever sifted flour, you know that that sifting process stirs up stuff and causes stuff to fly up. It separates you, it stirs and troubles you. And finally, the devil has his request. But look at verse 32. But I pray for you that your faith shall not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Verse 33. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you, both to prison and to die and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you. You will deny three times that you know me. Pressure situation. 
But there's purpose in it. Tell somebody there's purpose in this. And the purpose is found in verse 32. When you return to me, strengthen your brothers. Now, for time's sake, I'm just going to summarize what happened with Peter. Indeed, the prophetic word that the Lord spoke to him came true. For as Judas betrayed him in the Garden of Gethsemane, they, they carried him away, and Peter followed from afar. John, the apostle, followed Jesus into the palace, but Peter followed him from a distance. There's a lesson for you. If you're going to walk with Jesus, stay close. If you're going to walk with Jesus, stay close. Don't be, don't lose him in the crowd. Stay close. In the presence of the Lord, not only is there fullness of joy, but there's safety. Amen. And so Peter denied him three times. And when he denied him the third time, Peter wept bitterly. And he looked at Jesus, and Jesus looked at Peter. And Peter says, oh, my. I just knew that I was willing to go to prison for him. I just knew that I was willing to go to death for him. But here I am saying, I'm not a disciple. I'm not one that walked in. I've never, I don't know. Look at, bleep, 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 bleep. No, the man. You fill in the blank. And so it was. Peter was gracefully broken. God loves you so much. He received you just as you were. But he loves you too much to leave you that way. Oh, yes, you came in maybe a little drunk, a little tipsy. You might have come into this walk maybe smoking a joint. You might have come into this here running game on people trying to, you know, hustle and beat them out of their money. You came into this broke, busting, and disgusted. You came into this with your worldly way. But God says, I will perfect that which concerns me. God says, I will perfect that which concerns me. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, his, his, his mercy endures forever. And the psalmist says in 138 and 8, oh, Lord, take not your hand away from your work. Don't stop working on me, Lord. Continue to perfect my spirit. Continue to strengthen me in my inner man. For now I know I'm not all that. Now just take this last closing and we're going to get up out of here. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. It took all that to really lay the foundation. So that you might see that Peter learned a valuable lesson. And because the Lord told him, when you return to me, strengthen your brothers, Peter took that commandment to heart. Peter says, if there's one thing I do in this life, if there's one thing, I'm going to strengthen the brethren. So in the first epistle of Peter, we find the following word. First Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you, be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Let me build on this just for a moment, if you will. Because this is critical to our transformation. Peter came to realize that he was being self-confident, self-dependent, and he didn't realize he was operating under the tutelage and leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ while Jesus was on earth. Peter had not received the Holy Ghost. He just had a veil of protection upon him that simply declared, touch not my anointing and do my prophets no harm. But because Peter thought he was that, the Lord had to gracefully break him and tear him down like a set of Legos. Yes, Peter was built up high like uh, Spider-Man, but God broke him down like a paved street. He leveled him up because he said, I can't use you with the pride operated in your heart. Oh, yes, I have already declared that you shall be Peter. And what I said, I will not take back. And yes, you have cried bitter tears. Yes, you are sorry and contrite for what you did. I knew it. That's why I let the devil do what he did. I needed him to break you down. Yes, Tasha Cobb sings the song, Gracefully Broken. And I have taken that and released that into my spirit because, yes, I must always clothe myself with the mindset that I must be humble before God. Always. Regardless of how high the Lord raised me, I must always seek to be low. Because I don't want God to resist me when he searches my heart. And says, oh, St. Marvin, I see some essence of self. That which comes, if it hinders your walk, it's oftentimes pride. 
I was telling my wife earlier, I gave her a little snippet, a little sort of a, you know, a trailer of today's sermon. And it comes from 1 John, where 1 John chapter 2, he says that, Love not the world, neither the things of the world, for the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life. It, it means that the Father is not in you. For the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Now, I think most of you will agree. You can more readily recognize lust of the flesh. You can more readily recognize lust of the eye. But I challenge you to examine yourself with a true eye and find pride in your heart. Because it, it can be manifest as hubris. It can be uh, uh, demonstrated as insolence. It can be uh, manifest as arrogance. But the thing about pride is it lurks in your blind spot. You, you might try to turn, think you, 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 but you can't quite see it. Oh, but God will have someone walk into your presence and go, you know, I think I see a little pride there. What you talking about? <laughs> I'm the humblest person I know. <laughs> you don't know me. You ain't my judge. Shoot. I've been walking with Jesus 30 years. Oh, and they begin to read their resume of self Def definition. What are you talking about? I'm a bishop. <laughs> You're not hearing me. And, and we're quick to defend our title, our stature, our elevated assessment of self. But when you examine this passage of scripture, this word submit is a Greek word which means hubertasso. It means to take up a low position and to cover yourself with the shield. You have gotten low because you're saying, there's arrows coming at me, and there's forces against me, so I will reduce myself. I will reduce my stature. I am going to get small in face of this great wind that's coming against me. For the battle is too strong for me to be victorious in it on my own. And where he says, God resists the proud. That's another military term which means that it is like a phalanx where the Greek Spartans would line up shoulder to shoulder with their shields and, and dare the forces against them to get through the phalanx. That's what God is saying happens to your prayers when there's pride operating within you. Your prayers are going up and you ding. The force field of resistance is against you. It's like in those Star Trek movies, if I may digress, when you're shooting and there's photon torpedoes just bouncing off the shield. But the shields won't allow you to get into the presence because God says there's some, something of the devil within you and it's called pride. I can't use you. I will break you and then elevate you. I know this is not an easy message. It's just a necessary message because God wants to elevate many of you. And you don't even have to be in ministry because your ministry is serving God wherever you are. Amen. Wherever you are. And so he says, strengthen the brethren. It means strengthen my people. Strengthen the elect of God. He says, yes, all of you be submissive. You see there? Yes, all of you be submissive. Your strength is in your surrender, is in your submission. To, the, to one another and be clothed with humility. Put on humility. This word humility simply means don't have such an inflated assessment of yourself. Esteem others greater than you. Amen? I'm not going to dwell on it. You, you, you guys are educated enough. It's to have a lowliness of mind. And we learn from the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take, your yoke upon, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. I am meek and lowly of heart. When the King of kings and the Lord of lords says, I am meek and lowly, then we are to arm ourselves and clothe ourselves with the same mind. If Jesus did it, then what are we? So God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. How many are waiting on the promotion? How many are waiting for an advance? How many are waiting on a breakthrough? 
How many have sent forth a prayer and you just figure that prayer just doesn't seem to be getting answered? I'm praying and I'm praying, but I can't hear from God. Have you ever been there? I've been there. I've been there. And if, when the Lord called me to ministry 30 years ago and then anointed me and filled me with the Holy Spirit, I just knew I was arrived. I knew I was arrived. But no, the Lord told me, you shall be. And I thought I was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know this from experience. I ain't just talking to you about what Peter experienced. I'm talking about what I had to do to get to where I am. And I've shared with y'all in the past that I was laying on my face, crying out to God, saying, Lord, I know you've anointed me. I know you've, you've caught me because I've seen your hand in my life. I've seen the prophetic word come true that you've given. I've seen all this. And so, Lord, why am I not where you have already called me to be? And then some month later or so, I'll tell this story because it's beneficial. My wife and daughter were out doing the thing that she does. She's probably out running errands, probably somewhere Michael's, you know, looking at fabric or somewhere else, touching stuff. You know, you know what y'all do. You know, buying stuff and then taking it back tomorrow. That's okay. It's all right. <laughs> that's what y'all do. It's okay. All I know is they just went home. And, you know, that's okay. See, we're gone. And she was training Camille how to be just like her, going to the stores and... No, don't buy this yet, Camille. Let's go look, touch some more product. <laughs> you want to teach them. And so they were out doing that thing that mothers do. I was at home watching golf on the golf channel. Looking at my favorites, Tiger Wood and Phil Mickelson. You know, having a Walter Mitty moment. And then the television froze. Right mid-swing. And I grabbed the remote and... And surfed on up to BET, watching some African-American drama. I don't know what it is. doesn't matter. <laughs> the point being, the channel froze. I'm going, that gum Comcast, man. <laughs> I go on back down to the golf channel. I'm going, man, I'm so tired of Comcast. Little did I know. Instead of just punching BET, I strode channel by channel. And the channel between the golf channel and BET was the G-O-D channel. Right smack in the middle between my favorite pastimes, golf and BET. There was the God channel. And I said, Lord, you're trying to talk to me, aren't you? I took a seat in my family room and said, Lord, talk. You got my undivided attention. My wife ain't here. The dog's not barking. You got me. Talk to me. It turns out John Bevere was on TV talking about authority and leadership and how God will not lay aside his structure for the head of every woman is the man. The head of every man is Christ and the head of Christ is God. Regardless of how much he loves you, he will not lay aside his command and control structures. And he said, until you start reverencing your pastor with the reverence due the head that I have placed you under, you will remain in that timeout position. Yeah. I go, wow, Lord. Now, John didn't tell me that, but the Holy Spirit was translating. And I was listening because I knew this was not a Comcast issue. <laughs> and so I sat there, leaning forward like this, going, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I see what I've been doing wrong, Lord. And I wept like Peter. I go, oh, God, forgive me. And he says, I will when you apologize to your pastor. I said, well, Lord, he's getting ready to go to Vietnam. Uh, and, and so uh, I'll, I'll change my ways, Lord. I'll just be a better man. I'll, I'll, I'll just be humble. And he said, no, no, no. You have to apologize to him. You have to humble yourself before the one I've placed you under. I said, Lord, but he's going to go to Vietnam. He says, you got a cell phone. Call him. I'm like, damn. How about if I wait till he get back? Call him. And I'm like, damn. Y'all ain't never been here. That's okay. I'm sitting there looking at that phone. Do I just press the speed dial? Or do I punch the numbers in all 10 carats? I'm like, I got to think about it. He said, no, speed dial it. I'm reading your heart. Speed dial it. 
And wouldn't you know, he answered. <laughs> oh, I was praying in the spirit that he would go to voicemail. Oh, yes, I was. <laughs> but he's getting ready to take a flight. I'm like, ha, Lord, I called. I called, Lord. <laughs> he didn't answer. And I say, uh, hey, uh, Pastor, Pastor yeah, hi, this is Minister Marvin. I was an elder. Yeah, this is Minister Marvin. Hey, Minister Marvin, uh, I'm, I'm about to get on this place. I know, but listen, the Lord told me to call you. He told me to apologize for not respecting you and holding your high esteem for the position that he's placed you in and the fact that he's placed me under you. So you're a man under authority and you have people under you. You say to one go and he goes and another come and he comes. You say do this and he does it. Forgive me for having not held you in the high esteem that is worthy, that you're worthy of. Pastor, man, some of you bless me, man. I say, look, I'm just going to be obedient to God and to you. As I'm not here by accident, I've been appointed to here. But God has told me that he will not move me forward until I deal with that one thing. You have to be willing to hear and obey what God is saying to you. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. You belong to the Lord. Blood bought. Sanctified. And God says, I will break you gracefully that I may promote you. Oh, a burden was taken off of me when I released what the Holy Spirit had revealed. And there are things going on in your life that when you go into your prayer closet today, you release it to God and say, Lord, give me an ear to hear. Give me a heart to receive and a willingness to do your will. Not my will, but thine be done. That's the authority that Jesus gave Peter when he says, whatsoever things you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever things you loose on earth shall be loose. He, he said, but before you can get to that, Peter, you got to get to this. Moving on to my close. Verse 6. Therefore, humble yourself. That's why I had to tell you the story. I had to humble myself. Under the mighty hand of God. That he may exalt me in due time. The due time speaks of the kairos of God. And the chronos of man. God sits outside of time and at his appointed time, things take place in your life. Because God has already ordained it. Let me say that again. God saw the time, and at the epical moment, he says, oh, it's time for me to promote him. Because I knew that he was going to obey once I revealed to him. Once he really decided he really wanted to know what was hindering him and what was keeping him back. Once he got to that point, he said, Lord, I got to know. Now I'll let him know. For now the epical moment has come, and I can use him now. There are things that God wants to do in your life that only you are standing in the way of that promotion. He says, God will perfect that which concerns you. Verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. This is a hard thing sometimes for us Christians. It's a hard thing oftentimes for men. This word means to heave your cares upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever it is, whatever it is, cast all of your anxiety and your care upon him, for he cares for you. You know, it's a journey. It's a journey. But the sooner you get to this point, the sooner you walk a little lighter, the sooner you can go a little further. Amen. Amen. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. This is that teachable moment. This is that moment in uh, Gethsemane. This is that moment where Peter came to realize where the Lord Jesus Christ says, strengthen your brother's after you've returned to me. Peter learned a personal lesson and that I'm not all that and I'm not the bag of chips. And so this is the same word when Jesus and the disciples were in the garden of Gethsemane and he came to Peter, James, and John and said, man, wake up. Can you not pray for an hour? Pray that you enter not into temptation. Jesus prayed three times and came to his disciples and they were sleeping. Said, wake up that you enter not into. Watch and pray that you enter not into testing. But they fell asleep. Peter learned that lesson because he looked back on the video of his life. He said, man, when Jesus told me to pray, I was sleeping. When he told me to watch, I said, no, I'm cool. I got this, Jesus. I'm good. And so, having failed and got up, Peter now tells us all, be sober, be vigilant. This word sober is to be calm and collected in spirit. 
It is to be temperate and circumspect. I like this word, circumspect. It's to be aware of your circumstance and, and the surroundings. It is to go through life in communion with God so, you, so that your spirit man can get a discernment. You go, hmm, that ain't sitting right in my spirit. Let me go to my prayer closet and say, Lord, what's going on with this one? What's going on with that one? And he'll give you what you need to know. And be vigilant to give strict attention to. Cause to be cautious. For why? Because the devil, our adversary, is looking for that opportune moment to pounce on us. The devil is like, <laughs> uh, I caught you sleeping. <laughs> Let me pounce like a lion. And so you have to be the watchman on the wall. That's for yourself, for your spouse, for your children. You have to be so prayerful that you're going to, uh, news bulletin. Parents of kids that have ear pods examine their music list from time to time. Because, gee, back in the day when I was growing up, you didn't have the benefit of ear pods. You had a loud speaker. And if I was playing something my parents didn't agree with, they said, what the heck you got on? <laughs> and my record became a flying saucer. <laughs> <laughs> because, see, they were able to do their job because I couldn't get away with playing my music. I'm like, what the what? <laughs> Boy, I bought up my money. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but with the earbuds, it's hard for you to be vigilant over your children. Because you don't know what they're allowing to saturate their mind, to seduce them so that the devil can pounce on them because they're being brainwashed with the message of this world. That was a public service announcement. <laughs> it's for your benefit. You pay for that phone. I bet most of y'all pay for that phone. And even if you didn't, they're still under your roof. You have to be watchful. Just as Jesus was watchful for his disciples, just he interceded for Peter and for James and John and all the others. You have to be more engaged in what your children are listening to and what they're looking at. They have access to things that, at my age, we didn't have access to that corruption when I was growing up. But they have access to the world and all of its trappings. Okay, back to the word. Now, hopefully that was beneficial to everybody. That was designed to edify you. Verse 8. And I'm about to step on down. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. That means the whole world, brothers and sisters. Don't you, just because this, this translation says brother, don't you count yourself out, sisters. Verse 10. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, if you haven't already come to know that there is going to be some suffering in this walk, it's part of your calling. And, and you might try to dodge it or avoid it, but it's part of your perfecting. The strengthening that we get is also through the suffering we experience Part of that suffering is simply just dying to self. Yeah. Simply saying, not my will, but thine be done. And instead of going to the party where there's drinking and smoking, you say, no, I don't care if you are my friend or my brother, I can't go. I don't, I'm not going to expose myself to that. As much as I like you, no, I'm not going. And that's just a minor request. Amen. But he says, after you have suffered a while, that's an undisclosed period. He'll say, he'll perfect you. He'll equip you. He'll outfit you so that the next time around you'll be stronger. He'll put you in order just as he orders the ranks. He'll put you in your right position because you've now submitted. You've now humbled yourself. And now he says, okay, now I can put you in that spot because I can use you. I will establish you. He will make you unmovable. How many just want to be such a bedrock Christian? That when the difficulty does come into your life, and it will, you'll say, I'm anchored and rooted and grounded in the Lord. I'm, I'm called to suffer for Christ's sake. Suffering don't last always. We may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. We need to recognize the truth of these verses so that when the difficulty comes, you won't lose your salvation. You won't lose your mind, but you'll take refuge oh, in the high tower, which is Christ Jesus. Amen. Give the Lord a praise. And he said, I'm going to establish you. 
I'm going to make you unmovable. And then I'm going to strengthen you. The Greek for that is to make you firm in spiritual knowledge and power. To strengthen your soul, your will, your emotion, your intellect. So that you don't fly off because of your emotional state. You will be anchored in the Lord and say, that's okay. God is with me. God is by my side. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Whether a base or a bound, I'm determined to go all the way. Whether friends come or friends go, I'm going to stay with Jesus all the way. If I get that house on the hill, that's fine. But if I have to stay in this little shanty, that's fine. Because as long as I'm in the presence of the Lord, that's all that I desire. For in the presence of the Lord is the fullness of joy. And it's right here in the presence of the more. I don't have to have all the silver and the gold. I don't have to have all the cattle from the thousands. But if I have Jesus. Oh, yes, don't you forget. He says that I will settle you. Oh, yes, you'll be settled. You'll be a firm foundation so that you can minister to others when they're going through. You'll be able to strengthen the brethren. Oh, yes, you will. You'll be able to strengthen the sistering. Oh, yes, you will, because God has now planted you. God has now established you. God has now strengthened you. God has now made you able and equipped you. Glory to God. Let there be no doubt about it. I have a news bulletin for you. When God called you, he factored in all your stupid decisions in advance. <laughs> I'm not pointing at you. You figured you blowed it to the point, like Peter, Peter left the church when he denounced Jesus. But God had already said, you shall be Peter, and I've already given you the keys to the kingdom. I factored in your stupid Peter. <laughs> it's in the equation. I have factored in your denial. He didn't betray him. He denied him. And even more importantly than that, God knew his heart. And for those of you who have fallen and you weren't sure if God would forgive you or receive you, as you rest on your feet and as you stand in the presence of God, know this. God factored in all of your failures. He factored in when you left him for a season, but he had already ordained you were going to be a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter, and you're going to return to him when you came to yourself. You're going to say, let me go back to my father's house, be in my father's house of bread of plenty. And I'll go back and say, Father, forgive me. Just make me a servant. But the father's not having none of that. He'll say, kill the fatted lamb and get him a robe, get him a ring, and get him some shoes for my son, which was dead, is now alive. The one who was lost is now found. Yes, you've fallen. You might have fallen seven times, but God said, I'll get you up seven more times. He's already ordained purpose in your life. Being in ministry or being in the workplace, God has already chosen you to do great things. But in order for you to accomplish them, God says he resists the proud. And allow the Holy Spirit to search your heart and shine the light of truth upon any area of your life that you're keeping from God. And declare in truth, in spirit and in truth, withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Lord, here I am, withholding nothing. I give myself away for I've been bought with a price. Withholding nothing, Lord. Forgive me for every art, and, and if there's something I've done to be an offense, Lord, even reveal that, that I might go up and address it too, Lord, that I might be fit for the master's use. God wants to strengthen you. He wants to establish you. He wants to use you. But he also wants you to cast every care upon him. That you might come to know he cares for you. It's good that you have sought degrees. That's a good thing. It's good that you have sought to build a business. That's a good thing. But what God would want you to know is to have him first and foremost. Peter left his business. They had a decent business, but there was a calling on his life. I'm not telling anybody to leave their business. I'm telling you to put God first. He says, he resists the proud, but give grace unto the humble. I know I want more grace, but when I'm weak, then am I strong, for his grace is sufficient. So you don't have to be in a, a dire way, but realize that God wants to bring you closer. He wants to use you in a way you've not been used before. But he says, you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. 
And just as I saw his face to find out, Lord, whatever it is that I'm doing that's not pleasing, let me know because I want to be right with you. And I'm not special. I'm not anyone different from you and from you and from you. So as you come to the altar, come with one petition, Lord, to be in your presence, to do your will. I submit myself unto you. You come with a humble heart and say, Lord, I give myself away. Lord, I cast every care upon you. If you know the Lord is talking to you, don't delay. Don't let pride or self-control or self-doubt or worthiness hinder you. Just come. Make the devil real mad. Don't allow him to say they're looking at you. Let them look. They don't know why you're coming. All they know is that you responded to God's calling. And you know that God is able to do exceeding and abundant above all that you can ask or even think about according to the power that's at work in you. The power of God wants to be released on you. The atmosphere has been set by the praise team. The presence of the Lord is in the house. But not only thing missing is you humbling yourself. You desiring what God has for you. You coming to Jesus. That's the only thing that remains. This is not my word. This is God's word. God cannot lie. It's impossible for him to lie. He wants to release you to go forth and do things in his name. He wants you to be dependent upon him for everything. He wants you to have a mindset where you'll cast every care upon him and come to know that he cares for you. Oh, yes. He cares for you. He cares for you like you can never, ever imagine how he cares for you. He cares for you so much that he died for you. He died for you. When you didn't have a mind for him, he died for you. When you didn't even have a desire for him, he died for you. When you're out doing the things that you want to do, when you're doing your will, he died for you. Oh, what love, what great love the Father has for you. But maybe you haven't really come to know Jesus yet as your personal Lord and Savior. He's calling you. He's calling you. He's calling you to come, to cry out unto him. Say, Lord, forgive me for all of my sins. Wash me in your blood. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. For I believe that you died on the cross for all of my sins and that you were buried on the third day. God the Father raised you from the dead. And right now, Lord Jesus, I open the door to my heart. And I receive you into my heart as my Lord and my Savior. Now, Lord, use me for your glory and honor. Use me, Lord God. Make me a vessel fit for the master's use. Altar workers, please come find someone. And allow the Holy Spirit to use you in a way that will enable them to cut aside and lay off every weight and sin which is so easily beset them. That they may be fit for the master's use. As they cry out, God promises to hear every cry and to take off every burden. But he's a good God like that. Minister to the very need. Strengthen them in that place where they need strength. Build them up where they've been torn down. 